current events, Bible prophecy, the ancient past. How does it all fit together? Find out now. This is Pictures of the End. Hello and thank you for joining us today. You are listening to Pictures of the End. And we will continue our march through the Bible today as we look at the book of Psalms. We have been looking at every book of the Bible in each episode, seeing how uh, in every book of the Bible, God has implanted a message for this generation of earth's history. We're going to find the same thing as we study this longest book of the Bible, the book of Psalms today. The Psalms contain prayers and songs offered to God by the nation of Israel, both in their private and in their public worship. The 150 songs in the book cover the entire range of human emotion, from anger and frustration to praise and exaltation and fear and sorrow as well. This diversity is unified by the consistent focus on God as the creator and redeemer. King David is the principal author of the Psalms. However, others were contributed by people such as Moses, Solomon, Asaph, Hezekiah, and others. The writing and collection of the Psalms spanned the 15th to the 3rd centuries before Christ. Jesus Christ is the primary personality revealed in the Psalms. As one commentator puts it, the Psalms are full of Christ. There is a more complete picture of him in Psalms than in the Gospels. The Gospels tell us that he went to the mountain to pray, but the Psalms give us his prayer. The Gospels tell us that he was crucified, but the Psalms tell us what went on in his own heart during the crucifixion. The Gospels tell us he went back to heaven, but the Psalms begin where the Gospels leave off and show us Christ seated in heaven. The Psalms reveal the power of music in the human experience and also its significance in this great controversy being waged between good and evil. Numerous psalms contain references to events elsewhere described in Bible prophecy. And today we're going to begin by looking at just a few of those examples of psalms that are either directly quoted later in uh, Bible prophecy or where the uh, same ideas and themes are picked up in the prophecies, especially in the book of Revelation. Let's start by turning to the 15th Psalm, and I'm going to just read it. It's short. It's five verses long. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not, he that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. This is a short psalm, but a beautiful psalm, one of encouragement and counsel about how to live a life that God will bless. And ultimately, this place of blessing, this place of of safety, where uh, David, who is the author of this psalm, says he wants to live is in the tabernacle of God on God's holy hill. And then in the verses that follow that first verse, uh, which we just read, there is an explanation of the kind of character that is needed for a person to have that experience. Uh, That person needs to walk uprightly. They need to do what is righteous or, or right. They need to speak truth in their heart. Verse 3 brings out that this person that will dwell with God in his holy hill uh, will not backbite with his tongue. Uh, He won't do evil to his neighbor. Uh, He won't take up a reproach against his neighbor. Uh, And it goes on. So we can see that the the character is the primary um, focus on what it uh, means to be able to live in God's presence. Now, if we compare that with a prophecy in the book of Revelation— there are some striking parallels. Um, first of all, in Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5, there is described a group of people. They're called the 144,000. And many of the characteristics described here in uh, Psalm 15, we find repeated in Revelation chapter 14. 
There John writes, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And you'll notice that John is seeing this group of 144,000 standing uh, next to God, next to Jesus Christ, the Lamb, and they are on a mountain, just like David said in Psalm 15, who can ascend the holy hill. Now, John goes on in Revelation 14. Um, I'm going to jump down just a couple of verses. And uh, verse number three, they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. And before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song, but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. There is a song on the lips of those that are redeemed from this world of sin and that uh, now get to spend eternity with their God and Savior. Verse 4, Revelation 14 goes on. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. This is speaking uh, metaphorically, in, in terms of uh, spiritually being completely devoted to Christ, not being um, uh, adulterated, so to speak, as the Bible uses this term of, of mixing our allegiance with things of the world and things with God. The Bible goes on, still in verse 4, These are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And I'll look at verse 5 of Revelation 14. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. It's almost as if David and John are talking about the same group of people here. And um, certainly, uh, God is preventing, or presenting to both of them the uh, requirements. You know, what does it take to live in God's presence? What kind of experience is necessary with Jesus that will allow us to Uh, live forever on his holy hill in his presence. And we find it both in Psalms and in Revelation. It's a complete surrender to Jesus Christ. It's allowing him to live and work and speak in us so that there is nothing um, inauthentic, nothing false, nothing that would um, allow us willingly to be taken away from his presence. Let's look at another example. Uh, Going to Psalm 27, uh, another example, beautiful little verse here by David. He says in Psalm 27, verses 4 and 5, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me up upon a rock. Here David is even uh, expressing more specifically where this place of safety is that he wants to dwell. He says it's in the house of the Lord. That's the the tabernacle or the sanctuary, the the temple in heaven, which uh, the New Testament, the book of Hebrews especially, talks a lot about. This is where David wants to be. And then in uh, the second part of this verse that we read, He says that in the time of trouble, God will hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle, he will hide me. He will set me up upon a rock. This is uh, describing the most holy place. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was was positioned. Uh, That was the most uh, secret or hidden place of the entire uh, sanctuary and temple. And there were also rocks in there, the Law of God, written by God on tables of stone, these were contained in the most holy place, in the Ark of the Covenant. Um, Only the high priest was allowed in the most holy place once a year on the Day of Atonement. And the high priest represents Jesus Christ, our high priest, humanity's high priest. And uh, one of the common symbols for Christ throughout the Bible is a rock as well. So there's at least two rocks there in the most holy place. There's Jesus Christ himself, and then there's the law of God or the Ten Commandments. And this is where David says he wants to be hidden. This is the place of safety. It's very interesting, again, as we turn to Revelation, that there are a number of references to the most holy place in heaven's sanctuary. For example, in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, John says this, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. There were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hell. So um, in vision, John sees 
heaven, he sees into the temple in heaven, and he sees even into the most holy place in heaven, and then inside the most holy place, he sees the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of God's Testament there. He's seeing the same thing that David's, uh, he's seeing the same place that David says he wants to be hidden uh, in this time of trouble. In Revelation 15, verse 8, there's another fascinating passage where John explains something that's happening in heaven's uh, temple right at the end of time. Here I'm reading from Revelation 15, verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now, uh, there's some significant things going on here. You know, nobody can enter into the most holy place in heaven's uh, sanctuary or heaven's temple. Um, But David has already said in Psalm chapter 27 that the place of safety in this time of trouble is in the most holy place. And so really what David is saying is that we can have an experience now by faith where we dwell with Jesus Christ, our high priest, in the most holy place in heaven. And um, when that time comes, when these changes take place in heaven's temple and no man can enter in, we can already be inside by faith. It really speaks, friends, to the importance of pursuing a daily relationship with Jesus Christ. A daily relationship with Jesus Christ. One more example from the book of Psalms is Psalm 91. Uh, Another beautiful psalm that has brought encouragement and hope uh, to people for hundreds, even thousands of years since it was uh, first written. And here we find a great promise in verses 9 and 10. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. And it goes on, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. A great promise that God can give spiritual victory to those who put their trust in him. And these symbols of the the lion and the dragon and the adder or the serpent uh, all appear in the New Testament, and they appear in the book of Revelation. Um, for example, in Revelation chapter 12, we read these verses, starting in verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And so in the book of Revelation, we find that the devil is referred to using the symbols of a dragon and a serpent. Well, those are the exact same thing that uh, Psalm 91 says God can give us victory over when we place our trust in Jesus Christ. We are just about to a break. Following the break, we are going to come back and look at the significance of music in the great controversy being waged between good and evil. You are listening to Pictures of the End. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Is your life so busy you don't seem to have time to read the Bible? Do you want to understand the Bible better but don't know where to start? Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, a daily Bible study podcast designed to help you connect with God's Word. Each 15-minute podcast looks at a timely and relevant subject, connecting the Bible's timeless teachings with your life today. Want to dive in even deeper? Our website includes free weekly study guides that accompany each lesson. Go ahead, dive into God's Word, dig a little deeper, discover the Bible's message for you today. Deeper can be found on your favorite podcast service, including iTunes and Google Play. You can also subscribe online at www.pathwaytoparadise.org. That's www.pathwaytoparadise.org. Or call us toll free at 855 His Truth. That's 855 447 8788.
Welcome back. You are listening to Pictures of the End. Today we are looking at the book of Psalms in the first half of the program. We noted some similarities between just a few of the Psalms and prophecies in the book of Revelation. As we continue in the second half of our program today, we're going to look very broadly at the issue of music and how it plays out in the plan of salvation and in this great controversy or battle between good and evil. It's worth noting that God was and still is the first musician. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, we read this, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. And what a beautiful thought that when uh, a sinner comes to Christ, when they surrender their lives to God, uh, God is so happy. He's so filled with joy by this that he bursts into song. And so we see that music is really an extension of God. It is part of his creation that uh, ultimately is intended to lead us back to him. Now, today, many people would probably say, well, music, it's, it's, a, it's an art form, which it is, um, but it's just a form of personal expression. Well, that's partly true, but that also leaves, if we just leave it at that, that it's just a form of personal expression or just an art form, we miss a very important aspect of music, and that is that it is part of God's creation, and it is a tool that can either lead us closer to God or or as we'll see today, can lead us away from God. Very quickly, let's just look through a few of the passages in the book of Revelation that describe music surrounding God's throne. This obviously would be music that is intended to lead us to worship of God and to a closer relationship with him. There are at least seven uh, scholars uh, have numbered these a little bit differently, but there are at least seven different scenes in the book of Revelation where we see music and praise surrounding the throne of God. One of these, uh, often mentioned as the first one, is found in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. I'll actually read from the verse before in verse 10. Then the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their thrones before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And we see this theme recurring again and again in the book of Revelation, that God's throne is surrounded by music that praises him as creator and as redeemer. Now this first verse we read focused on his role as creator. The next one in Revelation chapter 5 Uh, really focuses on his work in redemption. So Revelation chapter 5, beginning in verse number 9, says this, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Here's a hymn of praise to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who in the book of Revelation often appears as the Lamb. This hymn of praise goes on in verse 11, where John says, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands. So almost an innumerable number of heavenly beings and creatures surrounding God's throne. And we find out in verse 12 what they are singing. And they said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And we find these scenes of praise recurring again and again through the book of Revelation. In chapter 7, again, we have all the angels. There are 24 elders and there are four beasts of some kind that surround God's throne. In Revelation chapter 11, the 24 elders again are mentioned. Um, In Revelation chapter 14, it's the 144,000 that are singing a new song to God. We looked at that reference before the break in the first half of our show. 
In Revelation chapter 15, it's all those who are redeemed from sin and who have been saved that are uh, mentioned singing to God. Let's read that verse, Revelation 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. What a uh, triumphant song of praise and victory and thanksgiving here in Revelation chapter 15. And so we find that heaven is, uh, God's throne in heaven is surrounded by music. It has been, God himself sings. He gave that gift of music to his creatures, whether they're the angels in heaven Uh, Obviously, he's given that gift of music to uh, human beings as well. And he also gave it to uh, an angel in heaven that um, ended up rebelling against God. And that angel was Lucifer, who became the devil, according to the Bible. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 28, we find out something very interesting and fascinating about this angel who later became Satan. And that is that he was created with amazing musical abilities. I'm reading now from Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 and 13. And this passage is going to refer to Satan or Lucifer uh, under the name of the king of Tyre, who is a, a type or a symbol of the devil at this point. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created." fascinating and very important passage here in the book of Ezekiel that gives us some insight into how this angel Lucifer was created. He was created, first of all, perfect. God is not responsible for sin. That was this angel's fault, that uh, he allowed selfishness and pride to rise up in his heart. The Bible says that he was created perfect in beauty, and certainly he was beautiful. We read about the description of his covering. Every precious stone was thy covering. Uh, Imagine the the rainbows and the prisms that would have reflected off of this angel as he stood there next to God's throne. But what we're focusing on here today is the fact that God created Lucifer also as an amazing musical instrument. At the very end of that passage, we read that thy tabrets and thy pipes or sorry, the workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that you were created. And so not only does God himself in heaven sing, uh, and not only is God's throne in heaven surrounded by music, but this angel who became Satan or the devil, he also is a master musician. God created him that way. And among the many gifts of God, that the devil has twisted and perverted and used for his own purposes is this gift of music. And uh, never forget that the devil is a master musician. And if he has created counterfeits in so many other areas, um, spiritually and in human experience, it should not surprise us if he also has used music for his own purposes. Now, there are some interesting verses and as stories in the Bible that give us some insight into how the devil has accomplished this. In Genesis chapter 4, Jubal, who is the great, 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 great grandson of Cain, the first murderer, he is recorded as the first person to handle the harp and the organ. Now, this is the line of Cain, and in the Bible, the line of Cain, uh, his descendants take on the characteristic 
of uh, characteristics of Cain. They reflect his character. And the line of Cain is a rebellious um, and violent line of people. It's very interesting that it's Jubal in this line of Cain who is recorded in the Bible as the first person really to practice as a musician. In Exodus chapter 32, the Israelites form a golden calf and then commit idolatry and fornication as they dance around this idol. They're waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain. And a great plague uh, breaks out because of this, and many people die. In 1 Kings chapter 18, the false prophets of Baal, one of the Canaanite gods, they dance to wild music as they try to induce their false god to bring fire from heaven. Uh, Elijah, the prophet of God, is standing by, and when they finally get tired and quit, Elijah simply kneels down and prays and asks God to send fire on God's altar, and God responds. In the New Testament, Salome, the daughter of Herodias, dances in front of King Herod, then asks for the head of John the Baptist on a platter, and the request is granted. So we can find that throughout the Bible, music also, uh, it's revealed that music can be used uh, for purposes that are not good, uh, for purposes that would please the devil in his fight against God. Finally, in Revelation chapter 18, verses 21 through 23, we, f- we find that music is part of the sorcery that is used by the devil and this end-time spiritual Babylon to unite the world in false worship of God. A mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And then at the end of the next verse it says, For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Friends, the Bible is very clear that music is a great blessing. It is a gift from God. It can lead us closer to God. But the Bible is also clear that music can be used in the wrong ways, that it can be twisted by the devil um, to purposes that would lead us away from God. Now, we don't have time to really dive into this more, um, but I would encourage you to look carefully at the music in your life and uh, pray about this if you need to and ask God to show you if the music in your life is drawing you closer to God or further away from Him. It's an important issue. It's mentioned in the Bible, and it's mentioned in Bible prophecy. Well, thanks for joining us today. We are out of time, and I hope that you'll join us again next time. You have been listening to Pictures of the End, a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. Pictures of the End is available via your favorite podcast service and also at www.picturesoftheend.com.